بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So we're going to switch the mood from celebration to something more serious, as we're all laughing and 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 happy and joyous. Um, we all know what happened today. There are several earthquakes. So, you know, there was an earthquake in the morning, and then there were several more earthquakes in the evening at Usher time. And uh, if you check your homes, I hope everyone's okay. There are cracks in the foundations of my house, and there are a lot of things um, like that happening. So, I want to continue our discussion on the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. Although we did cover much of it, but in light of what happened today, um, these are signs that cause, well, that should prompt us to further reflect over, you know, what they mean for us. Um, and I'll begin with a verse in Surah Al-An'am, and I believe we did share this verse earlier, but we'll look at it in a little bit of detail. Um, in a verse, Allah speaks about earthquakes in one particular verse. And this verse is very, very important to put things in perspective. And the way the Prophet ﷺ read this verse is even more insightful. So, this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul huwa al-qadir Say he has the power. When you deal with situations like this, earthquake, the only thing that comes to your mind is the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know how powerless we are. Uh, we're at the mercy of the control and the, the mastery of Allah over the universe. In a moment, our fortunes can change. In a moment, we can go from laughing and suddenly we're gone. Our family is gone. Our property is gone. So this is the reality of life. And situations like earthquakes remind us of that. So in this particular verse, Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ Say, O Messenger, He, Allah, has the power to send you عذاب, suffering from above. Suffering from above. أَوْ مِنْ تَحْتِ أَرْجُلِكُمْ Or from below, suffering from below. Punishment from above, punishment from below. أَوْ يَلْبِسَكُمْ شِيَعًا وَيُذِيقَ بَعْدًا and he has the power to divide you into groups and factions and taste, make you taste the violence of one another. This is human conflict and war. And this is all going back to Allah. Allah is the one who is Qadir, has the power to send you suffering from above, suffering from below, and then dividing you into, into factions and different nations and Warring nations and factions in order to fight one another. Unzur kayfa nusarriful ayati la'allahum yafqahun. See how Allah repeats his signs so that they may understand. So these are all signs of Allah. So what is suffering from above? But all the natural disasters have come, come from above. What are examples? What would be coming? Rain? So terrible rain, storms, thunder. Lightning striking, things like that. Um, you can add to that hail and sleep, and you know there there are terrible things that can come from above, things that are extra normal, and you can add to that the extra normal things that happened with previous nations, where the stones came from up above. So Allah has the power to send a suffering from above. Nobody should be in the position you're secure. You know the heavens are secure, the sky is just fixed and the atmosphere is protecting us, at any moment things can change, our fortunes can shift. What's punishment from below? What would be examples from below? Earthquakes, because they come from below the earth. The shifting of the tectonic plates below, below the earth. What, up, what else from below? Landslides, okay. Landslides are shifting of like mountains and things like that. Um, what about flooding from below? you know, upspring of, of ocean water and things like that. So Allah in this verse is sharing with you all the things that can go wrong, all types of natural disasters. And He divides into two broad categories. 
those that come from above and those that come from below. And then he adds to the mix, and this is a, something we mentioned that whenever Allah talks about his signs, so that there's no mistake, he'll add human things in there that we might not be accustomed to thinking of as signs of Allah, but they are signs of Allah. So like in that other verse, in fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilafi layli wal nahar, all these natural signs. But then in there Allah adds, wal fulki lati tajri fil bahri bima yanfa'un nahar and the ships that sail the seas with cargo. So even those are signs of Allah. Here is natural disasters from above, natural disasters from below, and then human conflict is also a sign of Allah, sign of Allah's power, human conflict. So you might be accustomed thinking, well, that has nothing to do with Allah, that's us, yes. But at some level, it's also a sign of Allah's power. So now, how did the Prophet ﷺ read this verse? In Sahih al-Bukhari in Kitab al-Tafsir, uh, we have this report that teaches us when this verse was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ, he read, قُلْ هُوَ الْقَادِرُ عَلَىٰ إِنْ يَبْعَثَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَذَابًا مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ Then he stopped. And he made a dua. What did he say? He said, أَعُوذُ بِوَجْهِكْ I seek refuge in your face, Ya Allah, in your countenance, Ya Allah. So, this teaches us many things. It teaches us how the Prophet recited the Qur'an. His recitation was a deliberation of the meaning of the Qur'an. So he was interacting with the Qur'an. Often in the Qur'an he would stop and he would interact with it and make dua. There was a verse about Jannah, he would make dua, Allah make us from that. There was a verse of punishment like this, he would seek refuge in Allah from that. <coughs> so the Prophet ﷺ, his recitation was interactive. And it shows that he was deeply thinking about the meanings of the Qur'an. Sometimes he spent the entire night in just one verse. There's reports that he recited just one verse the entire night, just thinking about it, deliberating over it. So punishments above elicited this reaction from the Prophet A'udhu bi wajhik. He became so fearful and he made his dua. And then he recited, Aw min tahti arjulikum, and from below, and he stopped again and he made the same dua. A'udhu bi wajhik. I seek refuge in you, Ya Allah. This made him so scared, just this idea of these natural disasters. And then he recited, O Yalbisakum Shi'an. And then we divide you into factions and make you taste the violence of one another. Here, he stopped and he made a different dua, or he said something different. What did he say? He said, Hadha Aysar, or Hadha Ahwan. Which means this is easier to deal with. So you can see what is you know, the lesson here, the insight from the Prophet ﷺ, the insight is that Allah's power is no match for the power of human beings or all the things that human beings can do. What Allah can produce, what Allah can bring is no match for what human beings can do to one another or to anyone else. So that's why the Prophet, when it came to natural disasters, he was so fearful. And he said, A'udhu bi wajhi. But when it came to human conflict as a sign of Allah, here now he said, Hadha Aysa. Meaning, this is easier to deal with. It's not a good thing. It just means now this we can deal with. <coughs> so, <coughs> this is very, very important. When you look at, and you just compare the power of Allah and what human beings can do. Uh, if you just compare one of the natural disasters that happened in our lifetime, I guess the greatest natural disaster of our generation was what? For our generation, the younger people, maybe the older people might have something else. Sandy? Sandy? Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, that reminds me of a, of a meme. There's a lawn chair, and it says, 2024 New Jersey earthquake, we will rebuild. And in someone's lawn, there's a lawn chair that's up and a lawn chair that's down. <laughs> So Sandy, um, I'm talking about in humanity, the greatest natural disaster. The tsunami, the Indian Ocean tsunami of our generation was probably the greatest example of a natural disaster. <coughs> How many people died? <coughs> Quarter of a million, 250,000. So that was like unprecedented. So what happened was beneath the Indian Ocean, it was an earthquake. So that's what a tsunami is. There's an earthquake between the ocean, underneath the ocean bed that causes the ocean to surge. So there was a magnitude 9 subterranean um, earthquake, and this happened in 2004, underneath the Indian Ocean. 
and it just lifted the ocean and the ocean went crashing into 11 different countries at you know speeds of 500 miles per hour and there were islands that were lifted up entire islands lifted up and brought back down and the people who described the scene it was like unbelievable water just engulfing entire like regions people described like you know the earth opening up people just being swallowed up so it was a terrible terrible disaster so the scientists that you know analyze the, the blast that led to the Indian Ocean tsunami, the earthquake underneath the Indian Ocean, um, they made an interesting observation. I was thinking about that. Um, if I ask you what's the worst thing that human beings, or the most destructive thing that, thing that human beings have ever come, with, come up with and used in our history? Nukes, yeah, what kind of nukes? Yeah, exactly. Nuclear, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that was, you know, it's a terrible thing. And this is the most destructive thing that we have ever been able to come up with as human beings in our history. Now, in the Indian Ocean tsunami, the scientists said that the, the force that was generated by that earthquake under the Indian Ocean was equivalent to compared to the Hiroshima bomb, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what's the scale? What do you think the scale would be? That single blast was equivalent to 23,000 Hiroshima bombs. So that's, that's, a, that's a great sign within a sign of Allah, which teaches us the power of Allah is no match for the power of human beings. So. When it comes to the, 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 the power and the, the, you know, these things that Allah can bring at any moment, they should make us fearful. They should make us very scared. When it comes to human conflict, that's something we can deal with. We have ways and it's still very terrible, but you know, we, we do things. We try to take matters in our own hands. We try to make the world a better place. We can do better. We always pick up and rebuild. But Allah's power is unprecedented. You cannot even compare it to the power of any other part of creation. So that's a great lesson we learned from this verse and the way the Prophet Sallallahu he interacted with this verse. So now earthquakes, coming back to the idea of earthquakes, now we can have a discussion of how we're supposed to um, <laughs> respond to things like this. Is it something that or like a, an eclipse, there's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse coming. Is it solar? Or is, it's a solar eclipse coming um, in two days. So some people, some human beings, they look at these things and they're like, oh man, cool. And then like, that's the response they have and it's just something, you know, um, they're laughing about it, joking about it. But as Imam Abdullah Smith reminded us, Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْآيَاتِ إِلَّا تَخْوِيفَ We don't send these signs except to inspire fear. Khawf. So the first thing that these things should inspire in us which should be fear and khawf. And that's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. We should have this fear in us when we see things like that. When an earthquake happens, when these supernatural or, or extra normal events happen, we should be very fearful. Um, and that is a good thing because fear is a first emotion that tempers the arrogance. When you don't have fear, you feel like you control the world, I'm at the top of the world, I'm the greatest of all time, and this and that. That kind of attitude is an attitude that has no fear, but it's silly because you're nothing. So, for the believer, all these things should inspire fear. And, and that's how the Prophet ﷺ was. Whenever there was something like that, he would be very fearful, as he saw in this verse. There is a great hadith in Sahih Muslim that tells you how the Prophet ﷺ was. And just sitting here, I remember when I moved here 18 years ago, the first hadith I heard from Imam Rauf was this particular hadith. It always stuck with me. And here we are almost 20 years later and we're sharing the same hadith. So Aisha radiallahu an, anha, she described the Prophet ﷺ. She said, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا عَسَفَتِ الْرِيحِ <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ, whenever the winds became strong, 
قال, he would say the following prayer. Allahumma inni as'aluka khayraha wa khayra ma fiha wa khayra ma ursilat bi. Wa a'udhu bika min sharri ma fiha wa sharri ma ursilat bi. So he would say, oh, oh Allah, I ask you for any good that's part of this wind and what it contains, the good that it contains and the good that comes after it. And I seek refuge in you from any evil that this wind would come with or that would be in the aftermath of this wind. So he would be very fearful. And so she described him that this is the dua that he made. And then she said, وَإِذَا تَخَيَّلَتِ sama," When the color of the atmosphere would change, the sama, the heavens, when it would become dark, for instance, in the daytime or something like that. She said, تَغَيَّرَ لَوْنُهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم. His color would change. He was so connected with the elements that when these things happened, it would, you could see it on his face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The color of his face would change and she would say, وَخَرَجَ وَدَخَلَ وَأَقْبَلَ وَأَدْبَرَ And you would see him pacing around, leaving the room, coming back to the room, going here, going there. Whenever something like that extra natural used to happen, this is how the Prophet was. You could see that anxiety in him. You could see the color change in him and you can see these du'as from him. فَإِذَا مَطَرَتْ سُرِيَ عَنْهُ And when it started to rain, then he would relax. Because, you know, before rain comes, the sky gets dark. These clouds come. So, and she would ask him about it. Why, why would you do that? And she said, because this is what destroyed Aad and Thamud. The clouds came, but you don't know what the clouds contain. Something terrible or just natural rain, which is a mercy. So, this is the first thing that we need to keep in mind. The first reaction for the believer with earthquakes and these types of disasters, we should be very fearful. And that should inspire us to be humble and not be arrogant, not to make it into a spectacle and not to be someone taking selfies in the middle of these things. And imagine that's the end of your life. Um, and that's the end of many people's lives. Like these things happen, lightning strikes or they're at the edge of a cliff, they fall. Imagine the last thing is you're joking around with a selfie. That's the last image of you in this life. How silly that would be. So the believer should be very fearful. So the first thing, it should inspire fear. The second thing it should inspire, like earthquakes specifically, it should remind you of the day of judgment. Because what is that verse? Ya ladina amanu taqullaha wa inna zalzalata sa'ati shayun azim. Oh, you who believe, um, fear Allah, for verily the earthquake of that day is a terrible thing indeed. This is a very, very scary verse. Whenever you have an earthquake, you should think about, you know, what Allah says in this verse. Inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim. And Allah says, yawma tarawnaha tadhalu kullu murdi'atin ma arda'at. That's the day any woman who's breastfeeding a child, she will drop the child. Any woman who's pregnant and bearing a load, she will abort, have a miscarriage. That's the day, watara nasa sukara wa ma hum bi sukara. You will see people as if they're drunk, intoxicated, but they're not going to be intoxicated. It's just that the, the events of that day are so great, so unbelievably, like, uh, you cannot imagine the proportion of what's going to happen. So one of the prominent descriptions of the Day of Judgment is Zalzala, is an earthquake. In the Zalzala, uh, what's the verse? Um, the same verse I just quoted. The zalzala of the hour is a great thing indeed. And then Surah Al-Zilzal, what does that say? إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا When the earth shakes. وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا so, so the earthquake should remind you of the Day of Judgment. That's the second thing. So, when you get, so now we're getting more practical. First it should inspire fear. And then it should inspire you to think about the Day of Judgment and that should make it more practical for you. Now you start getting ready. Day of Judgment, this is what's going to happen. So you start becoming closer to Allah, you start increasing in your worship, start increasing in your istighfar. And the third thing it should inspire in us, it should make us look at our own sins and our own faults. Why so? Because we know the Quran tells us that every bad thing that happens is because of our sins. There are no exceptions. Every bad thing that happens to us is because of the consequences of our action. So when you have the first thing the believer thinks when there's a natural disaster, what are we doing wrong? 
what are the sins we're committing, what are we doing wrong. So, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Allah says, no musibah, no calamity happens to you except it's because of what your hands have earned. So every natural disaster, every calamity is because of the sins of human beings and the faults and the mistakes of human beings. But at the same time Allah says, وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ <coughs> so we can say every disaster is because of human sin. But not every human sin is punished. That's the mercy of Allah. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ He overlooks so many things. Um, that's why Allah says, you know, if we were to seize human beings for their sins, nobody would be left alive. That's a verse of the Quran as well. So, generally speaking, Earthquakes are because of the sins of human beings. Not just earthquakes, all types of calamities, even wars. So when things like that happen, the believer looks inward. Starts making istighfar and tawbah, reminding people, what are we doing wrong? Let's change our affairs. Let's have Allah. Perhaps Allah will have mercy on us. Ali bin Abi Talib used to say, ma waqa'a adhabun illa bidham. No punishment happens except because of a sin. Wa martafa'ahu illa bitawbah. And no punishment is lifted from people except through tawbah. So that's the two root causes in the li lives of human beings. Them, sins, uh, precipitate these types of punishments. And then tawbah is a remedy to avert those punishments and these calamities from the lives of human beings. And finally, the last thing, so inspiring fear, reminding of the last day, and then making us look inwards and looking at our sins and, and repenting from our sins and so on and so forth. The last thing is, and this is the higher station of the believer, the believer then starts seeing the hidden blessings and things like this. There is khair in everything. Like there's no absolute evil in the world. Everything has a purpose. So even these earthquakes, these things, at some level they're, they're tests for human beings. They're meant to remind you of Allah Azza wa Jal. And a calamity that reminds you of Allah is so better, so much better than prosperity that makes you forget Allah, as the scholars say. So if you have a disaster in your life and that makes you become closer to Allah, that disaster is the best blessing you could ever have. Versus if you were well off and you have wealth and you forget Allah, that prosperity is a curse and a blessing. So believers, they look at these things. They look at these things as hidden blessings. Um, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, "Man yurid Allahu bihi khayran, yusib min." When Allah desires good for someone, it's for some people, when Allah desires good for them, He afflicts them with trials and tribulations. So they can also be a blessing. Aisha radiAllahu an, she said that she asked the Prophet ﷺ about the plague, Ta'un, and this Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Kitab al-Tib. And he informed her, like, look, the plagues, they're adabun yaba'athullahu ala man yasha. Wa, and at the same time, he said, you know, the plague or these, these plagues are like, you know, those infections, like COVID. Everyone knows what it is now. Something similar to COVID. It's a natural disaster, but of a different kind. So the Prophet said that they are a punishment for some people, but they're also rahmatun lil mu'minina uh, li man yasha. They're also mercy for some of the believers. Allah uses them to elevate the believers, to purify them, and so on and so forth. So you can have a natural disaster that serves many purposes, and that's what they do. For some people, it's a punishment. For some people, it's a lifting up. For some people, it's a reminder for them to wake up and come back to Allah, and Allah wants them to come back to Him. So that's the great thing about calamity. The believers, it's all good for the believer. Right? That's the hadith. Ajaban li amril mu'min. Everything that happens to a believer is good. Good things happen to the believer is good. They're shakar. They are grateful and it's good for them. But bad things happen to the believer. Sabar wa khayrullah. They are patient. They're perseverant. And that is good for them. It just elevates them. So Ibn al-Qayyim reminds us that sometimes these disasters are a blessing. It's kind of like Allah is thinking about you. Is that better or if Allah never even looked at you, never even thought to bring you back to Him, to give you these signs. But Allah is giving you a sign, a chance to come back. It's kind of someone who's in love with somebody and he says, you know, although, you know, and that person doesn't love him back, 
or she doesn't love him back. And he quotes a verse of poetry that, look, yeah, the way you insult me, uh, it is annoying, but the fact that you're thinking about me, that also is comforting because, you know, you could be ignoring me, not even look at me and give me the light of day. The fact that you take the time to respond to me, even if though it's an insult, just that idea is comforting. So when you have these calamities, Allah is interacting with us. He's getting, he wants us to get closer to him. And it really is a purification for the believer. So these are some thoughts I wanted to share about the earthquake that happened today. May Allah make us those whose hearts are alive, who see the signs of Allah. And may Allah make us those who repent. Every time we have a chance like this, it makes us change our life around. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So yes, every calamity we know because of the Quran. The Quran says in many verse, not just that verse I quoted, but also it says, "Zahar al fasad fil barri wal bahri bima kasabat aydin nas." Corruption, fasad is many things, but it includes disasters, but it also includes the wars and conflicts and things like that. Fasad, corruption, injustice has appeared on the earth because of what? Bima kasabat aydin nas, because of what the hands of people have wrought. That means we can conclude that every single one of these things is because of sins and because of the injustice of human beings. Yes. But can you apply to every single person? Like, you know, if an earthquake happens, that means every single person here was sinful? No. So sometimes these things happen. Allah is punishing certain people, but a certain segment of that same population, Allah is rewarding them, making them shaheed. That's what happens. So when there's human conflict also, Generally speaking, it's because every human comfort, every society that collapsed in, in Islamic history, whether it's Andalus or Baghdad, if you analyze the root causes, the people had turned away from the deen. So the, when the Mongols came to Baghdad, you know, the people, the Muslims were in terrible shape. And when Andalus fell to the Crusaders, you know, in 1200s and in 1400s, if you read the stories of the Muslims, it was terrible. They were so in ghafla, they were so much into luxury and building these palaces and things like that. So, yes, every, every one of these is linked to the sins of human beings. But you can't say categorically we have to be humble. Like, why, does, why did Allah produce this earthquake? It could be that He's creating a better outcome, trying to elevate these people. And just punishing, it's a punishment for some, but an elevation for others. But overall, it's an elevation for this, these people. So, you know, we're, we're supposed to be humble. We shouldn't be like, sometimes you see Christian pastors, every time something happens, like Sandy happened, all these Christian pastors saying, this is because of this law, this is because of that, this is because, just small-minded thinking, as if God is your plaything, that he's going to do what you think about, and like he's concerned about your mundane affairs. So we should be humble. We shouldn't speak on behalf of Allah. So all we can do is know the general rules that are in the Quran and the principles, which is that, yes, calamities are linked to our sins, but individual calamities for individual people, it might be something that Allah it loves you and He wants you to get closer to Him, or Allah sees your mistake and He wants you to repent from your mistake, or Allah has had it with you and He wants to punish you and send you to hellfire. That could also be the case. So, Allah alam. Yes, ma'am. How, uh, how do you reconcile between the two notions in terms of war? You know, when we look at what's going on in Gaza or, or India or the Uyghurs or Sudan, how do you reconcile between the notion that mm -hmm. these things are due to our sins and the state of the Ummah and the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mercy, has, you know, like we're seeing it, you know, as a product of Gaza, the mass conversion or reversion of people back to Islam. So, so it's an excellent question. So <coughs> the, the problem here is, <coughs> excuse me, um, the problem is if you want to put one thing on it and just put it in one box, it won't work. So if you want to look at any situation that's happening with one explanation, it's not going to work. 
Allah's wisdom is vast and what Allah does in creation is has has so many levels so and that's why I shared that hadith like the ta'un right so the companions were really concerned about the ta'un the plague and they're like why is this happening because it happened in their lifetime and it happened later on in greater proportions they were wondering like are we being punished so then Aisha she remembered asking the Prophet ﷺ, and he said simultaneously it's adab and it's maghfira, rahma. Use the word rahma and you use the word adab. So from that we can learn that the same conflict, the same situation can be at same at, at one level as a punishment. And it has to be a punishment. We can't say there was nothing wrong there and then the, this came out of the blue because of verse after verse that teaches us because of the sins of human beings. But that, that does not mean, that does not mean that when bad things happen to people we, we blame them because it's because they're sinful. This is something we, as believers we recognize, but you know, it could be that there's some sinful people and Allah is just like, you know, when fitna comes, when conflict comes, when natural disasters come, they don't distinguish. That's the problem with natural disasters. They don't distinguish between the people that are, deserve to be punished and the people who have nothing to do with it. Same thing with war. So for sure, many of the people in the war are righteous believers that have nothing to do with it. But at the same time, I can look at the situation of the Muslims in every country, including Palestine, and see how they were, you know, how they were, you know, their religious practice. There's so much that left to be desired. So we can say at the same moment, the conflict can be many, many things. In general, it is a punishment for our sins. Allah wants us to. But it's also a test for the rest of us. What are we doing? We're not here supposed to be blaming people and blaming the victim. We're supposed to help them. And most of them are innocent. In fact, all of them are innocent, but, you know, so this is Allah's wisdom in, in creation. We can't explain, I can't say category, we should always be humble, and we should just draw these general principles and always say, Wallahu alam. Nobody should speak on behalf of God. That's what Christians do a lot. And some Muslims fall into that. They'll say categorically, this has happened, see, I told you, this is because of this. No one really knows. We're at the mercy of Allah, Zawajah. Um, but we have these general principles in the Quran. Um, Abu Ali has said something interesting, I didn't quote it, but uh, he said, Man asa Allah fil ard, faqad afsada fil ard. Whoever disobeys Allah in the earth, he has corrupted the earth. Lianna salahul ardi was sama bitta'a. The rectification of the earth and the heavens is, do, is based on obedience. So, based on things like this and the verses of Quran, we, for sure we can say whenever bad things happen, there are some problems. So we need to look inwards in a humble way, with not a blaming way, and try to make tawbah, make istighfar. Why do we make tawbah and istighfar if we have no sins? So surely all of us are sinners. So all of us, we can improve in our life to some degree. Wallahu Rami, yes. Yeah, so, fit, so what is fitna? Fitna is when something gets overwhelming and it takes over everything. So fitna is initially like a punishment or some purpose, but then it will affect the whole society. Even the pious people will die. And that's why something is very fearful. Like the, what's happening in Gaza, like instead of looking at the people of Gaza, we should look at ourselves. What I think about really deeply, and I, um, the injustice is so tremendous. And we know who's behind the injustice, who's bankrolling the injustice. So we know injustice, there's always a critical mass where Allah steps in and says that's enough. That's how it always has been. It's a natural law of the universe. No empire lasts forever. And empires, they usually go to a certain degree in their tyranny and injustice. When it passes a certain critical mass, they implode. So surely this empire will implode. There's nothing you can be more certain of. This empire is going to implode. But the real question for us, where are we going to be? What is our role going to be? It's very scary. I don't have the answers. We should try to rectify things, try to remind people that, look, you shouldn't be bankrolling this. It's crazy what's going on. This is, you're not going to survive like this. Not because of what we're doing. We're not subverting anything. It's the natural law of the universe. That in empires, tyrants, they never survive. They only, Allah gives them muhla, and then some circumstances are created. So in the world, you're seeing a post-Pax Americana emerging. A new world is emerging that's going to be 
post-American world. So that's very scary for Muslims. There's a lot of soul searching that we need to do. You know, we want the best for this country and we should remind them, look, this is your end. You need to stop this. This is not right for you. You're, you're not going to survive this. Not because of what we're doing or anything like that. We're not planning anything. It's not one of those things. It's just a spiritual thing. Injustice doesn't last forever. People hate you around the world. And everywhere you go, you're, you're going to have no place where you can have peace and security by acting like this, like bankrolling this and not changing. And the tragedy is, you know, had they stopped what they were doing, we could have a different discussion, but it's still going on. They're still sending weapons, they're still sending... That's what fitna is, coming back to fitna. When that fitna comes and inevitably will come, it's going to swallow up everyone. So, where are we going to be? We have to make the istighfar, toba, our intellectuals need to do soul searching to see what the Muslim role will be. But the future is definitely not here, unless things change and it doesn't look like they're changing. Wallahu a'lam. Yes, bro. Yeah, so that's the fourth level that I talked about. That when he's, the fourth level is that's where whatever is happening, even the bad things, you're content, you're happy. You know that Allah is thinking about you, you know that Allah has decreed it. So you don't get very anxious about it. And that's a level of Iman that comes it's very hard. So those believers like that, even in calamity, they're happy. You know, like so. Remember, like the story I shared? Well, maybe you weren't here. Um, you can remind me about, you know, Abu Yazid al-Bastami. He said, you know, I've never had an experience like this young youth from Balkh. Ma ghalabani ahadun, ma ghalabani shabun min Balkh. Uh, Abu Yazid al-Bastami is great, Zahid, and a great scholar. And he said, I've never had this type of experience um, like meeting this young boy from Balkh, which is a region in Afghanistan. And that young boy was Shaqiq al-Balkhi, a great Zahid, another great uh, early Muslim. And he said, this is what happened. Because he, he asked me, Ma zuhdu indu, ma zuhdu indukum. How do you guys, because he, he's from Balkh, he came to Abu Yazid and he said, how, are you, do you, how do you guys see zuhd? This idea of being away from the dunya. How do you practice that in your people? He said, in wajadna, akalna, in faqadna, uh, sabarna. He said, we have a good attitude. So Abu Yazid said, when we find, when we have things, we enjoy them. When we don't have, faqadna, sabarna, we have patience, sabar. And that's a good thing. That's a thing, good thing for believers. When you have blessings, when you find blessings before you, food and things like that, you, you enjoy them. But when you don't have them, you're patient. So, Shaqiq al-Balqi, he said to him, you know, hakada kilab al-Balqi indana. He said, you know what, your state is like the dogs in our region. So you're like the dogs in our region. That's what the dogs do. They find something to eat, they eat. When they don't have something to eat, fine. They don't eat. They're patient. So then Abu Yazid asked him, He said, okay, how, how do you guys practice zuhud? The pious people among you, how did they see zuhud? What did he say? He said, um, in faqadna shakarna um, wa in wajadna atharna. He said, when we don't have something, when we find we lack of food or whatever, uh, we're grateful to Allah. He didn't say we're sabr, he says shakar. So they're content with the decree of Allah. Even that they see as, 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 as a reason to be grateful. We don't have, we're shakir instead of sabr. But when we do have, what do they do? They didn't say we enjoy. Atharna means they prefer others over themselves. So when they find blessings, they give it to others. So that's a much higher station. So that's what reminded me of that. So at some level, even in these situations, you are grateful. And wallahi, you see people in Gaza, they are smiling, some of them. Where do they get that iman and that satisfaction? You know, they have like a pleasure that nobody else has. And that's something enviable. It's not something to cry over. They should be crying over us. Our hearts are dead, they're alive. So that's the reality, the real believer, when he looks at the reality of dunya, and with the true eyes, and they have believing hearts, that's what they see. Wallahu a'lam. It's the latest we've ever stretched our lecture, 130. <laughs> How do you reconcile that on the 
So on an individual level, you can never say that. So that is unjust. Like nobody can say that. Nobody should say that to anybody. Um, that's, these are general laws of Allah as well in the universe. But it doesn't mean you can apply them to individual circumstances. So we should remind people that you don't know the wisdom of Allah in individual circumstances. So nobody should say things like that because you really don't know. And it's, it could be that someone has no sin and Allah afflicts them just to raise their station. Ashaddu nasi bala'an al anbiya. Allah says, the, the human beings that are tried the most, have most afflictions, are the anbiya. Do the anbiya have sin? No. So, and then he says, um, what did he say after that? Thumma al amthal fal amthal. And then the people that are closest to the anbiya. So there's also a category of people that don't have sin and Allah afflicts them just to bring them closer to Him. So we don't know which one of this. So some of these salaf, they used to say, well, whenever there's a calamity, either Allah is punishing the person or He's uh, bringing him to a higher station. So we don't know which one applies to individual people because we don't know the wisdom of Allah. We should remind people to not say things like that and just, you should be hopeful when you talk to individual people, you know, uh, be hopeful, inspire them, tell them, look, Allah is purifying us, there's a new uh, situation coming, better days are ahead, behind every night there's a dawn, so just be patient, Allah is going to change the affairs, and Allah does change the affairs. No uh, situation lasts forever, whether it's good or bad. These are the days we deal out to people, days of prosperity, days of adversity, days of conflict, days of peace. This is just a cycle of life because life is a test at the end of the day. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam.